cochlear implants are a wonderful invention that help people who lose too much hearing. So uh, this is my mother. This is a uh, hear. This is her hearing aid. She has a hearing aid, and if if you think about it. Uh, what all hearing aid is doing is boosting the amplification during the conduction period, just enough that the sensory neural, which is diminished in a person with uh, presbyacusis, which is what my mom has, uh, just enough that that, that, that that the sensory neural that is, that is working can take this amplified signal and make something out of it. But when this no longer works, People that have become that have presbyacusis or other conditions that make them deaf postlingually, they've had they've learned language, they've spoken for a while, and now they can't hear anymore. A very good option for these individuals is a cochlear implant, and this shows a cochlear implant. So a the way that a cochlear implant works is that it has a uh, traditional um, audio processor, and that goes to a transmitter, which then transmits into the, a, a set of electrodes that's along the length of the cochlea. So it, it um, does a, essentially a Fourier transform on the incoming sound and then sends the highest frequencies to the base of the cochlea and progressively lower frequencies up towards the apex of the, of the um, cochlea. So what does a cochlear implant depend on? It depends on having the cranial nerve eight, the eighth cranial nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve intact. You still have to have those afferents. You still have to have the uh, spiral ganglion afferents. Um, all you're replacing are the hair cells. So you're replacing the hair cells and now you're stimulating directly the spiral ganglion afferents. This is a, um, is a hybrid uh, cochlear implant. It's a n new one that was developed at University of Iowa by Bruce Gewertz. And it, what it does is it, it only replaces, it only uses the cochlear implant for the highest frequencies. It leaves intact the lower frequencies, which in, in this individual, um, he, he still hears the lower frequencies, but he can't hear the higher frequencies. So he just has a traditional hearing aid for the lower frequencies, and he has the cochlear implant for the higher frequencies. Now, this contraption, there's a mag this, this magnetized um, transmitter is, there's a magnetized base that's implanted into the skull, and so this just snaps right on. Um, this contraption is, is, is a big deal, and just as my mother takes out her hearing aid every night and puts it in every morning, a person with a cochlear implant will take this contraption off. Now, most people with cochlear implant have the traditional version, which is just the audio processor and the, and the um, transmitter. So they'll take this whole thing off at, at night when they go to sleep. So that means that at night they are deaf. Okay, alarm clock not going to work. All right, so who is a candidate for, uh, for this um, cochlear implant and how well does it work? Well, anyone who, who has a complete loss of hearing is a candidate. Um, they have to have spiral ganglion uh, function. They have to have vestibular cochlear nerve function. And they have to have either... They have to have experience with language, so they've gone deaf postlingually, or they have to be under three years old, preferably under one year old. So one group of people that get cochlear implants are adults, so, and the experience with the cochlear implant depends critically on what the experience is prior to uh, getting the cochlear implant. If, if you've had good hearing and good language skills, getting the uh, cochlear implant is going to be virtually seamless. Sounds will, 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 will um, be perceived differently, but they will be recognized. So for example, um, the individual shown here had good hearing before he lost his hearing. 
when he got this cochlear implant, it was really easy. He didn't have to make a big effort. He did not have to make an effort to understand what was happening around him. That said, he does say that, that certain sounds sounded differently. So for example, the T in boat sounded not like, not as he remembered it, but differently. But after about a week, he got used to it. And now he no longer notices it. So that's, that's the adaptability of, of the brain interpretation of what, what the information is. On the other hand, Michael Koros, who wrote the book Rebuilt, uh, felt that he had to become a perceptual athlete in order to figure out what the heck the cochlear implant was sending him. And the, the difference here is that, uh, is that he had very poor hearing from the get-go, never had great hearing, never had uh, the, the hearing language skills that, that um, this individual had. Okay, now what about a baby? A baby is born deaf and can get a cochlear implant. Now, the problem here is that the cochlear implant has to be uh, put in before the age of three. After the age of three, that cochlear implant is completely useless. And it gets progressively less useful the way, longer you wait within that three years. So the best idea is to do it with, before the age of one. Um, and, and to do it in both ears because it's not a situation where you can, uh, you, you can teach your brain how to um, understand a signal later. You have to give this baby an opportunity to learn what to do with this sensory input. The sensory input may be different from uh, what occurs naturally. It's coming from an electrode instead of from the cochlear function, but it is, it is the sensory input that this baby has to work with. Now, when the baby gets the cochlear implant, the work is not over. Uh, Dana Suskind here at the University of Chicago uh, noticed uh, a long time ago when she was uh, implanting these um, cochlear implants, that the babies acquired language differently, uh, not according to the success of the operation, which was pretty routine after a while for her, but um, by their exposure to words, that babies need to be exposed to words, they need to be exposed to language in order to learn language. So just as a person who becomes deaf postlingually, their experience with language is going to tell you how well they're going to do with the cochlear implant. The baby's exposure and involvement with language is going to tell you how well that cochlear implant is going to work. It only can work on what information is given uh, into the system. The final thing I want to say is that this issue of whether to give a baby a cochlear implant is a highly emotional and um, and personal decision. So as one can imagine, a deaf parent who is a sign, who signs, who is a signing person, not um, part of the hearing world, who has a deaf baby, that's a, a choice. They, to, to um, put in a cochlear implant is a very, uh, different choice being made for their baby than was made for them, that would, than was possible for them. And there is um, a feeling among some within the deaf community that uh, this will uh, end the signing community, end the deaf community. Um, and indeed, in Australia, the, the deaf community has shrunk greatly as the uh, use of co cochlear implants has expanded. Um, for hearing parents, the, the calculus may be different. In any case, this is a, an incredibly um, challenging decision to make. It's a very tough decision to make. I don't envy these parents. Um, and as a future physician, it is important to remember that you need to be the partner in, in allowing, them, allowing the parents to make the decision while not making the decision for them. So. Speaking of sign language, we're now going to talk about sign language.